So from Australia, I went to Hong Kong for the Sakyadita conference, uh, which I know everyone heard a little about because I got to see Venerable Jampa and Venerable Sam K there. It was a joy to see familiar faces and be reminded how much I wanted to come back to Shravasti when I got back to the US. Uh, and I really enjoyed the conference because I got to sort of come in contact with some of the countries and traditions I didn't manage to fit into the year. And it also reminded me how much the physical setting affects the atmosphere of a group. Like I think this year, the conference, well, it was at a university, so I think the setting was unusually academic and the feel of the conference was quite formal and academic. Um, and I've seen that at some of the monasteries I was at as well. The first one, if it looks a lot like all the houses in the village and is within shouting distance, um, there seemed, it was the, the line between sort of lay life and monastic life was a little blurry. Same way that during morning puja, one of the nuns would be in the corner making breakfast. So there's sort of a <laughs> pressure cooker hissing. Um, whereas then if a temple's in a city behind a high wall, then it's this sort of oasis from the city. But then if it's in a more rural setting, but behind a high wall, it feels a little isolated. So I was really, I don't tend to think much about architecture, so it was really <laughs> interesting this year to find I was thinking a lot about the physical layout um, and how that reflects different parts of the community. Um, and at the Sakyadita conference, I was sort of hounding anyone in black robes to please tell me where to go in Japan because I was surprised not to find any Japanese monastics at all at Sakyadita. Um, and I ended up asking uh, monastics in Japan about that. And it has to do with sort of the um, partly hierarchy and partly belief that you needed to be sort of an English speaking academic to be at the conference. So hopefully um, that's cleared up in the future. Uh, so I arrived in Japan still piecing together my plans because it had been a late addition to my project um, and was very lucky to find that an American Zen priest who had trained in Japan um, is extremely helpful and friendly and quick to respond to peculiar messages uh, because I think I wrote her about two days before I arrived in Japan. Um, and she put me in touch with a lot of her Dharma sisters and her teacher. Um, and I had never been involved with Zen practice at all and just really loved it. And um, one of the temples I stayed at, the, the monk is, um, he's 72 now and is the abbot of two temples. So it's quite a lot of work, but um, he, he trained when he was a young monk, there was an American or an Irish American woman who, who came and trained in the temple and was very respected and very revered and unfortunately died quite young. Um, but I sort of felt like Mora had made space for me. And it was because of how she broke through some of the barriers that um, Yamamoto Roshi has this really deep respect and, and admiration for, for women, women who want to come and practice. Um, so I was sort of coming in on her coattails. And uh, even though there was a bit of a language barrier, I do not speak Japanese. Um, <laughs> He was so patient with me and showing me the practices and explaining the evenings, like writing down or drawing pictures or finding whatever sort of cultural common ground we had to explain Dharma to me. Um, and even breaking down Japanese terms that reflect belief, like what you say before a meal, um, with the root of the word has to do with killing. And it's a recognition that lives have to be lost to sustain us, whether it's elephant lives or rice lives. It was not elephant lives, don't worry. <laughs> but um, whatever it is you're eating, that needs to be respected. Um, and another thing I loved was learning the monastic meal etiquette. It was really amazing. It's like an art. <laughs> uh, and that conveys that respect. Um, and that was something I loved about the Soto Zen practice, was that you're trying to be fully present in anything you're doing, like everything should be part of practice, whether you're peeling apples or cleaning 
or eating or whatever it is. Um, and I also got to go to the largest and really the only main training monastery for Soto Zen nuns, um, which is quite different from anywhere I'd been because it's not a stable residential community. It is um, most of the women training there will go back to sort of parish temples um, and run a temple, but they're there for a year or a few years to learn what it means to be a monastic and learn the etiquette and the ceremonies and the chanting and everything they need to know. Uh, so in one way, that means that there's a lot of coming and going from the community, but in another, I hope that there's this sort of extended network of nuns who've trained together and now are spread out at different temples um, around Japan. Partly my interest in Japan was that uh, monastic life is quite different in some ways, like things that are pretty fundamental precepts of monastic life uh, are, are not part of uh, Zen. Like priests often marry and have families. Um, but the, the abbess of the training monastery, who's very respected, even though nuns can marry, she encourages the nuns at her temple not to marry because uh, the typical thing would be for a nun to marry a monk. And then they're running a temple together, but he's sort of in the ceremonial role. Like he runs the temple and she's in the sort of temple wife hospitality role uh, that is not as conducive to, to practice. Um, so that's why Aoyama Roshi encourages the nuns not to marry. Um, and I did hear from nuns, I knew who, like, they felt if they had married, they wouldn't be able to be as devoted to their Dharma practice. And then others who find that it is compatible. And if you have a partner who understands the importance of discipline and sticking to your commitments and you both, you may live differently, but if you share that understanding, then it, it can be you know, an important part and selfless giving to others. And who are you going to give to more selflessly than your children? Um, really, it just depends on the person. Um, I think if there's anything that I want to say to Japan about Japan. Um, yeah, I really just learned a lot and hope to spend more time with Zen in the future and would be eager to go back. Um, and now here I am. And if you're wondering what's next um, and what I'm doing with all of, all of these stories, I'm wondering that too. <laughs> uh, I do think a lot about that more people today, more young people today, should consider what monasticism means. That doesn't mean you have to be interested in monastic life. That doesn't mean you have to commit. But just think about what those values are and what it is to live in community and live out your values in sort of every aspect of your day um, and how many of us are doing that in, in what our sort of daily work is. Um, and uh, the benefit of, of sharing your space with other people um, uh, Sufi poet Hafiz says um, to be kind to yourself and loving to those who must live with the sometimes difficult task of loving you. <laughs> so, and I like that a lot. Um, but really, it was most of all just a year of rejoicing in faith, whatever the name, and rejoicing in community, whatever the robes. So now I'm not sure what I'm doing, but I'll try to honor the places I've been and the people who have shared their time and their stories with me. Do you have any questions about the year? Yeah, the time. I didn't. Um, I thought about it. When I first wrote my project, I decided I would only go places with sort of broken lineage or um, which I don't know if that ended up being true. <laughs> um, but when I thought about it, like Taiwan is sort of, I thought of it as the hub of like, so many of the bhikshunis are so successful and so engaged and um, doing so much in their communities. Uh, in a way, I was, I'd heard sort of similar things about bhikshunis in Malaysia, that they were very involved, very educated, um, running all sorts of projects, and I was, interested to see what that looked like in a majority Muslim country. So 
was, so I think Taiwan was the last country to be cut from the plan. <laughs> now I hope I'll be there at some point. 